So my name is Tom Darenthal. I'll be your host. Uh, and I want to welcome you. I hope you're continuing to have a very nice summer. I think the summer lasts for one more week, two right? Months. Two weeks? Two months. Two months. Yeah, two more months. That's right. Oh, okay. Um, and we're going to start as, as we have in the past by um, going around and introducing uh, ourselves. And we're going to follow that with um, announcements. We're going to separate announcements and speak out. So if you have something to just announce, it's a quick, you know, one, one or two line thing. Um, please, please do that first. And then if you have something that we're going to discuss, we'll do that second. So again, my name is Tom Darenthal. I live on Nash Place. I'm part of the steering committee. Um, and we're going to start right here. <laughs> and after I'm the first one. Um, Zariah Sheher, Sport One City Councilor, I live on Hilder Drive. Uh, Nick Maiden, I live on Hilder Drive. Uh, Sam Doherty, uh, Colonial Square. And I'm Tim Doherty, and I live with Sam on Colonial Square. And I'm Lynn Severance, and I live next door to these guys. Well, in the back backyard. <laughs> We're in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Richard Hilliard, and I'm close to their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dave Cawley. I'm on his, next to his backyard, uh, Nash Place, and part of the Old East End. Hi, I'm Pat Seelan. I live in his house, or our house. <laughs> we share a backyard. And um, I live in on Nash Place in the Old East End. I'm Lindsay Carey, and I live on Calarco Court. I'm Catherine Verman. I live on North Street. Kathy Alwell. I live on North Prospect. Karen Long, Henry Street. I think we're supposed to switch to another. Oh, Here we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I saw the boss coming over. Oh. Is it my turn? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm Jake Schumann. Um, I live on Hildred Drive. I'm Fletcher Pratt, and I live on Riverside Ave. Joel Collada, 20 Chase Street, Old East End. Samantha Ayotte, 20 Chase Street, Old East End. My name is Grace. I live at the top of North Street. Hi, Scott Rogers. I'm with CEDAW. Hi, I'm Cindy Cook. I live on East Avenue. Hi, I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I live on 143 North Prospect Street, specifically. That's where I live. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I specifically live with Angie Chapel Sokol. And I'm on the steering committee. I'm Carol Livingston. I also live on Calarco Court, right next to Lindsay. And I'm on the steering committee as well. I'm Cheryl Green, and I live in Burlington Co housing just off East Avenue. I'm Peter Lukowski, and I live in the same place, Burlington Co-Housing. Okay. All right, do we have any announcements? Dave. I think everybody probably knows there's been a lot of signs around the neighborhood, but there's going to be a uh, public meeting on the uh, burlington Winooski Bridge, which is next uh, Tuesday, the 19th, and it's going to be at 6 uh, p.m. It's held at the O'Brien Center in Winooski. So folks may know that the, the funding has been made available through the infrastructure bill for the upgrade on the Winooski Bridge. And uh, not only is it for the Winooski Bridge, but it's also for the uh, whole intersection of Colchester Ave, Riverside Ave, and Barrett Street. So they're beginning a process. This is going to be a long, longer process, uh, it, but basically they have to have things under contract by the end of 2026. So what the stage they're at right now is that the, uh, the concepts that have been put forward in previous planning uh, are, are going to be uh, put into detailed planning. That's kind of the next step that will happen over the next year. 
So I want to let folks know that I'm participating uh, on the uh, uh, project uh, advisory committee. There's a group of 25 uh, people that make that up. Uh, Mark um, uh, from City Council is on, is on that group as well. So uh, I'm happy to uh, chat with anybody about it or if you'd like to get, have a mailing list for people that might be inter interested in learning more about it or uh, but certainly you're more than welcome to come out to the first public meeting and that's going to be next next Tuesday. Thanks Dave. Other announcements? A um, couple of things. Um, one is that um, Ward 1 is having um, a picnic on October 5th, which is a Thursday um, uh, from 5 to 7 and we're providing food, um, the usual barbecue stuff. Um, and then if you want to bring some kind of side dish or dessert or something, that would be great too. Um, so it'll be up by the barn, um, pretty low key, just an opportunity to um, meet your neighbors and to um, sort of catch up. Um, and I'll be sending out, we'll be sending out more um, information soon. Um, the other is that um, the wards that Charlie's, um, Charlie is in, and Charlie is our, uh, our um, town meeting TV guy, um, who really keeps us focused um, and published. Um, his his um, NPA, the wards two and three, have um, sponsored um, a, a zine, which is like a graphic, um, a graphic novel, a graphic magazine, um, and helped design it. We all chimed in as, um, as uh, steering committee members. Um, but the purpose of it is, and it'll be published, and everybody will get a copy, and we'll pass them out to people. Um, there's a poster of them um, that's out in the, um, and I can pass this around. Um, it basically tells the story of NPAs, what NPAs are, um, how to get involved, um, how, you know, how to, what happens at NPAs, and gives you more specific information about your own. So um, those we'll be sending out um, to folks. And um, the main person we need to thank for that is Sam, the woman who's in the right-hand corner of the poster. What's her name? The woman who does the graphics. Oh, Christine uh, Tyler-Hill. She, or also known as Tender Warrior, is the woman who does all the art. Who did all the art. So that, that will be available to you as well. And certainly, we have a number of those posters, so feel free to, to take those if you're interested. Karen, you had your hand up? No. Oh, OK. Any other announcements? Do we? Um, yes. I uh, just wanted to let people know Chase Street got its um, traffic calming uh, implementation version 1.0 put in. Uh, to recap, we had a block party where DPW attended and we expressed our desires for traffic calming, picked out some options. Uh, they were kind enough to come back with three um, possibilities for us and, oh, and uh, we ended up going with the most flexible temporary option, one that can be reconfigured. Uh, so signs are up. The somewhat temporary, semi-permanent is in place and we'll be looking to tweak it uh, in the coming months or year as we're going forward. So um, as you probably have noticed, the East, Hill, uh, East Avenue sidewalk is now completed and we're really, really happy about it. So a few of us are getting together to have a celebration with various conveyances, wheelchairs, skateboards, bicycles, whatever you want to bring. Um, it'll be either the 23rd or 24th. Watch in for, uh, Front Porch Forum and let me know if, if you want to be involved. We're going to have a bunch of kids, hopefully uh, some uh, trash cans to bang and other um, band type things and probably start from roughly co-housing or my house, which is middle of East Avenue, and go down to the to the end and back. And just to celebrate and to thank DPW for, for making that arterial passable by people when it has not been passable for years. So that's all. Other announcements? Yes. OK, so as everyone knows, we did redistricting. And because of that, um, people's wards have shifted. And so 
from working in the, in the polling places for the last 20 years or so, I know what is going to happen is that people are going to walk into their usually, usual polling place that they've been voting in for 10 to 40 years, and they're going to, they're going to probably wait in a line just to be told that you're in the wrong location. So I'm basically saying that people should go to the city website and they should go into like um, the, uh, uh, the city clerk's office and then look for elections and then eventually look for something called maps. Draw up the new map, not the old one because they're both going to be there. So drop the new map and, and blow it up until you can see your house. And that will tell you what ward you should should vote in, because I guarantee you, especially in wards two and three, there's going to be 50 to 100 people that walk in there, and they're going to be told you're in the wrong polling place, you need to go somewhere else. So I just advise people to uh, check exactly where, what their ward is, if there's any question. Thank you. Charlie, when's the next election that people will have to go and vote in? So that'll be the first Tuesday in March, and then okay. there'll be another one in August. And then the big presidential one will happen in November. So there's nothing scheduled for the rest of this year? Right. Okay. But everything has to stay the same. So even though I've been moved into Ward 2, I'm still officially in Ward 3 because there might be a special election. Like So, so legally, legally, the wards are they're kind of been changed, but they're kind of still the same because you don't know if there's <laughs> going to be a special election. Okay. So, but. so it depends on when the, if there is anything going on in... 2023, you're going to go to the Your old, old ward, yeah. but in 2024, you're going to go to the new voting place associated with your new ward. So I think by January, uh, the Secretary of State of Vermont will start changing over, because right now, if you ask the state of Vermont what ward you live in, if your ward's been changed, they're going to tell you you're in your old ward. So I'm, I'm hoping everybody checks what ward they live in, in like in January. But for legal reasons, everything is kind of confusing. I don't want to go into it, but um, I just advise people to make sure you know what you're doing when you go to vote. And, yep. so. and for right now, if, if you're going to change, you can go to uh, whichever NPA you think is better, right? <laughs> <laughs> always. Yeah. Oh, always. Okay, you're not moving. So. <laughs> but you can always go to any NPA. Like, I'm not from Ward 1, but I'm here. So you can go to any NPA meeting that you want, so. All right, Carol. So, I mean, yeah, Carol. So, Tom, is that something maybe we as an NPA could help at our subsequent meetings? We have maps, um, and we can try to keep our, you know, some sense I'm with help from Zariah yes, and Tim. So we're going um, to do that. Can you help us with it? I mean, we'll have maps so that you can see where you live now and where what ward you're in, and yes. then. Um, potentially what will change by um, January. So that's the least we could do is to have something posted every NPA so that you all would have a chance to. Yep. Scott, would you and, mind and I will say we were somewhat lucky because of the people in this room did a lot of advocacy. So Ward 1 did not change as much <laughs> as it had been proposed to change. So um, we were staying. It did change, yes. It had to change because it was the biggest ward, but not as much as originally. All right, any other announcements in the room? Can the people online hear us? You can, do a um, thumbs up. can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Carter Israel is saying he can't participate. He said he's here, oh, but he can't he participate. Oh, well, maybe he's in now. Yeah. Here, but can't seem to participate. All right, so we don't. Can, can people like raise their thumbs up or something or raise their hands if they can hear us? Uh, we're on mute though, aren't we? Uh, I'm on mute. But no, that's just this computer. No. What? No, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. This is the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, what if you. I think you need to unmute. So can you hear us now? Can people online hear us? Say no. <laughs> I think we just don't have sound for them, so we don't know. It sounds like they're talking to each other. <laughs> what are they saying? They formed a new sound word. Yeah. We also don't have a video here on the, okay. on the okay. lower left-hand corner. Right. Well, the that's video. the reason. Oh, is it? 
So somebody can write in the notes or somewhere whether they can at least hear us. Yeah, I just that, that. that would be helpful. Send them a chat. Yeah. Are you yeah. Yeah. Someone have one their phone number? I just texted Carter. Yeah, yeah. Click it. I don't think you need the video. But there. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> they can't hear us. They cannot. They cannot. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna move ahead. Um, Just a quick question, follow up yep. on that. Finding the work for people to go vote yep. in. What's the next steps on that? Are we allowed to know? So if you want to participate in doing that. We're going we're to try to bring a map to the next NPA meeting that can describe um, where the boundaries changed. Okay. And that will give people an idea of where, uh, what ward they're in now. Okay. And it sounds like the majority of the people are not going to be affected, but there will be some. All right, we're going to uh, shift gears and go to um, speak out. And so you really, it's a pretty open mic. You can bring up what you want to bring up. Okay. Yes. Oh, do you care if I go first? Okay. Um, hi, Samantha, uh, 20 Chase Street. I know I said that already, but just in case we. Um, so a couple of us through the Old East End have kind of communicated about this, but just to make other people aware, um, there are currently people camped in Schmanska Park, and I was fortunate enough to be there the other day when a Burlington park ranger was speaking with the people in the tent, and he then came up to me because he said, I see you're with your dog. It seems that you must be using this park a lot. So let me just give you a little rundown. And um, so I shared that with people of the Old East End, but I wanted to share it with you all as well. And um, so the couple living in the tent, uh, I do have their names. Their names are John and Lisa. They are a couple. They also have a dog. And they are not IV drug users, and they are working with a social worker to reintegrate into society. And um, the ranger believes that they are looking for work. They are very polite and are currently in transition. The ranger also let me know that he gave them until tomorrow, because of the rain and everything tonight, um, to kind of stick around and figure out what they're doing. Um, because he... He gave me insight that while I think there was a lot of misconception with um, the hotel vouchers um, being uh, being finished and a lot of unhoused people camping in a lot of the public parks and whether or not that's legal or illegal, he told me that it is illegal. They are not supposed to be camping in the parks. However, in situations like this, um, where we are fortunate enough that this is a very kind couple, they are in a transitional period in their lives, it is kind of a moral duty of us and especially the ranger, it's kind of a sticky situation to tiptoe around, but in order for them to make contact with a social worker, it's best that they have a place to stay for at least a couple of days so that a social worker will know where to find them. And um, I know that it can be very scary to be going into our public parks and not know of, you know, the situations that are going on. Um, but because of that, if you are at all worried, I talked to the ranger and he said, one of the best things that we can do is to see click fix the location of a tent. And so that the rangers know where they can show up and who they can talk to um, so that they can give these people in tents, the unhoused people, um, a couple of days and just have a conversation with them and figure out what their um, situation is. Um, so the c fix ha uh, helps a lot. Um, and then he also told me that contacting the Howard Street Center they have a lot of resources for 
um, for people to use, and that's a really positive place for them to um, seek out resources. Um, and then he also said, um, let me see what else he said. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway from that was that it's a very, um, very sensitive situation, and these people, in order to continue to get the help that they need, it it, it would behoove us to at least contact the rangers, but then have the rangers have a conversation with them so that they can still continue to get help. And just pushing people around from place to place to place doesn't help them. So allowing them to find resources that they need, I think, is a really important thing. Um, and I have the name and contact for the ranger. His name is Neil Preston. And um, you can find him on, uh, I think, the Parks website. But if anybody wants to write it down, his email is n preston p r e s t o n at burlingtonvt.gov and he was extremely polite he was very caring about the situation and um he knows that it is a very difficult situation to work around um but if you ever have any concerns he said that his email is always open his line is always open so give him a call, um, and yeah, if anybody has questions, um, let me know and let Neil know. But from what he told me, it is a very uh, respectable couple who is there who is just at a having a very difficult time right now. I have more of a question. I'm wondering if and when we're going to hear about the pipeline going from the... Wood Community heat? Yeah, the one going to UVM Hospital. It's going to go up Prospect. We and have someone here who can talk about that. Okay. And, and are we going to have any say about that or any feed... Any, is that going to come into a conversation? Hi, is that is that working? Hi, uh, I'm Darren Springer. For anyone I haven't met, I'm general manager of Burlington Electric Department. Uh, came over. We just had our electric commission meeting, so I was hoping to be here a little earlier. Um, so thanks for the question, because that's what I was here to to talk about a little bit. Um, is uh, the district heat proposal? I wanted to let everyone know that we have some resources on our website. Uh, burlingtonelectric.com uh, slash McNeil. Uh, we had a webinar just yesterday with uh, three communities uh, elsewhere, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, Lund, Sweden, and Halifax uh, in Canada, looking at how they're using uh, biomass district energy systems in their communities. Uh, that recording is on our website, as well as some Q&A documents and some other uh, reports. And I'd be glad to, to do a, a more in-depth presentation, but our goal has been uh, to be able to figure out once and for all, sort of, does this project uh, work uh, for the community financially uh, in terms of our goals, in terms of our energy goals? And we've been working really hard uh, with the potential customers like the hospital, uh, with our partner Evergreen Energy, which is uh, out of Minnesota, and they have uh, been involved in the St. Paul system, for example. And what we have is, is essentially a designed and engineered project for the first time in the history of this discussion that um, is actionable, um, but we are waiting to, to learn more uh, in terms of does this make sense economically for all involved? And if it does, our hope is to bring it forward uh, to the community, uh, to our electric commission, to the city council for consideration. Uh, so to answer your question very specifically, uh, if it does move forward, we anticipate having one or more work sessions at the city council to fully describe the project and the parameters of it uh, for the community and for policymakers uh, prior to it you know, moving forward in any respect. So there will be some additional process. Um, if, if there are any specific questions that I can answer and if it's appropriate at this time, I'm happy to. Uh, but if not, I at least wanted to say hello. Uh, I haven't been to Ward 1 MPA maybe in, uh, it seems like it's been either six months or a year. I can't remember the last time, but uh, glad to be with you all. Happy to answer questions and wanted to share the reference for our website. Can you just give us a quick idea about timeline of when you'll be talking 
Yeah, so tentatively, we're hoping to talk with the council in October. Um, very soon. We've been, we, well, soon in the context of a 40 year project, right? <laughs> but yes. Do you have, did you have a question or concern? My concern is that all the, the streets are going to be ripped up and the pipeline going through, and it's supposed to go right through where I live, and that's the disruption. That's my concern. No, and understand. also, we've had previous conversations about biomass energy, and it's um, dirty. clean, it being clean or dirty. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, in terms of the streets, uh, it's true. There would be a street project uh, to get a, a steam pipe up from the uh, McNeil plant up to the hospital, potentially uh, some UVM buildings if they join in. And then we would have a condensate loop that would return that could potentially connect to other buildings uh, or the Intervale Center or others. Um, so there would be, uh, during a limited period of time, there would be construction for the project. Um, so that's, that's a fair concern. I understand that. Um, we're trying to coordinate as best we can with DPW for any other work that might be taking place, but the timeline for the project may or may not line up with that. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of biomass, you know, generally, um, we've done a lot of work on this subject. There's a lot of the reports on our website uh, related to this topic. The thing I would say, I would say two things just briefly. Um, one is um, if you look at the types of wood that we're using, um, which is really primarily residues that are left over from other higher value logging operations. That's about 88 and a half percent of our wood is coming from wood chips that are from higher value operations where the residue is left over that would otherwise potentially decompose and emit carbon either way. Uh, as well as we get about 10% from sawmill residue and other mill residues that's left over waste wood product and one and a half percent roughly from the waste wood yard that folks can you know bring their clean untreated wood. Um, so our wood profile is about as favorable as you'll see um, in terms of having a carbon payback that's, that's favorable compared to the alternatives, natural gas, coal, other things for electric generation. And McNeil runs 92 to 98 percent of the time the alternative fuel on the New England grid is natural gas. So McNeil really is helping to displace fossil fuel when it's running. And if the project moves forward, it would displace about 16% of the natural gas that we use in Burlington in the commercial sector. So it's a really significant opportunity uh, in terms of our goals from a climate standpoint and otherwise to displace fossil fuels, um, using renewable fuels, and using essentially a waste wood product that we are already processing anyway with McNeil, but be able to use that plant more efficiently uh, to benefit the community. So that's why we're, we're pursuing the project. When you say short period of time uh, that the streets would be, what do you, what's a short period of time in your mind? Well, I mean, there would be a construction period that would be taking place if the project was approved and if it moved forward. Uh, they, there's a contemplated construction period um, you know, of uh, between a year and two years. Now, the streets aren't going to be disrupted that entire time. That would be for the entire project going from uh, McNeil all the way up to the hospital, all the engineering that would go into that. Um, How far is that? Uh, it's a couple miles. Two miles? Yeah. Yep. Is there any chance that we could get you to come to another MBA meeting so we could have more of a discussion? Because I think it's going to affect a lot of people in this room. And yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, first, uh, we have to see if the project's going to move forward, sure. obviously. But um, uh, I would also offer that we could have Evergreen Energy join us on Zoom. Uh, and they've been the engineers designing and, and working on the project. And we could go more in depth on the construction period, what it would look like, uh, exactly where the route is, uh, what you might be able to expect if the project's moving forward. I, I'd certainly be interested to do that. Yeah? Hey, there are microphones out there. I know there are. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that there's going to be a lot more natural gas used by you folks to get it up to the and I want to see exactly a tell us how much natural gas you use right now because you do use natural gas to augment what you're doing with the wood and how much more you're going to need to use to get this stuff up to the hospital, the university, or wherever it's supposed to go. So we do not generate electricity with natural gas. Uh, we generate electricity exclusively with wood chips. Um, the plant operations, the ancillary operations, can use some natural gas. And we've quantified that um, 
in our reports. We've looked at all of the different plant operations and any fossil fuels that it requires to get wood chips to the plant. Um, so we have reports that look at that from an emission standpoint. But I think it's a misconception because the plant is capable of generating electricity with natural gas, uh, but we don't do that and we haven't done it in over 10 years. And you're going to swear to us that you're not going to? I, this, this general manager of Burlington Electric will never sign off on generating electricity with natural gas. We're, we're a wood chip plant. We're renewable. I'm committed to that. You've got my word on that. Well, you've got my word on that. We got another question? Yeah, I have a question. I understand that a good piece of the economic feasibility of this depends on selling carbon credits. In other words, to get money from uh, other corporations or around the world who can uh, pay, basically pollute and pay us for or subsidize our uh, supposedly green uh, electricity generation. Could you uh, elaborate on that, please, the carbon credit issue? Sure. So district energy is not going to be about selling carbon credits, but I think you're talking about renewable energy credits with McNeil. Um, so McNeil as a renewable plant, and this is true for solar, for wind, for hydropower, any renewable energy facility that's connected in the New England grid creates renewable energy credits when it generates power. And what we do under Vermont law is we both buy and sell renewable energy credits to keep your rates as low as we can keep them. So we sell some McNeil credits, but we also buy back renewable credits that may be less expensive to make sure that every megawatt hour of electricity that's used by the people of Burlington is covered with renewable energy production in the New England system. Um, so I think that's what you're getting at. Those credits are all used within the New England grid and we're connected to the New England grid. Um, and that's really, it's, it's not a carbon credit system and it's not like an offset that's being sold somewhere else in the world. It's really a way that we account for renewable electricity in the New England system because you can't track an electron. Uh, once it's on the grid, you don't know where it's going from a physical standpoint. So these credits are created for every megawatt hour that you generate so that each utility can comply with its state's renewable portfolio standards essentially effectively. And where possible, if we can do so, we buy and sell credits uh, to be able to keep rates lower than they otherwise would be. But we are 100% renewable uh, both before and after we sell credits and buy them back. So this is not an offset issue? There's no offset happening here? Correct. There are no We're carbon offsets being sold. Polluting, uh, we are not selling carbon offsets, no. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Yep. Uh, can we um, table this? and move on a little bit we're a little bit behind schedule and maybe what we need is a separate meeting to further discuss this would that be would people we we actually do have a discussion item later about up topics for uh our meetings later in the year um maybe we should make this one of those topics sorry point of order um is this coming to the council october 7th or october 14th I think the first work section tentatively, I want to say October 10th uh, was Sorry, the first, I'm the if I'm remembering there. correctly. Yeah. First so work I, session, yeah. I do, I don't, I don't know when, I think that might be before we have an NPA again. So I wonder if it actually would be worth taking some of the time today to continue to talk about this instead of, because I think a lot of the questions that we have are more for Darren than they are for the, some of the specialists. So I think it might be worth. So okay. cutting into our time. Karen. So yeah, I came to speak about this because I did attend the seminar mm -hmm. that was announced in South Union Front Porch Forum on Monday the 10th. The seminar was Tuesday the 11th at 11 o'clock, which is not a very convenient time for most people. 42 people were there out of the whole city. Mm -hmm. I think it was announced in our NPA, I mean our um, Front Porch Forum w one East, but I never saw it. But there were three um, people, as you said, that spoke about it. it. There was nobody, there were no like, there was no well-rounded, you know, thing about information. There were three people that have biomass plants. The one in Nova Scotia spoke about their 30-year-old plant that had a crack in the casing and they had to shut it down for a year. Now we have a 40-year-old plant, which has been my concern for investing $40 million to tear up two miles of our street, what is that going to do in our carbon footprint to dig up our roads and re-asphalt them? 
and the other person that spoke from St. Paul, their plant is one block from City Hall and one block from the stadium. And they heat and cool the city with it and they only use urban tree waste. Now we are trucking, which is using gasoline. We aren't using electric trucks to bring in all this stuff. So it's very different what we're looking at in Burlington. And the last guy was from um, Sweden, as you said, and it seems like they have the newest and the cleanest biomass operation. But from what I read, we are polluting what far more our air by using, by burning you, the so-called waste. We could use that in particle board. It could be used in insulation, but instead we're burning it and we are sending those particles in our air. And I think the cost is exorbitant, 40 million, to go two miles and destroy our streets. I mean, two years is a long time for people to live with that construction. So uh, glad to respond to some of that, uh, if I can. Um, we did send out uh, to our, we have an email list uh, for Burlington Electric customers. So we sent out the webinar information there. We posted on social media. We did send it out on Front Porch Forum. So we did everything we could to get the word out. I appreciate if it didn't get to you in time. Monday, the, excuse me, but Monday, the day before the event is not enough time. 42 people in the whole city were there. That's well, it just, and, and to be fair, um, we have posted it on our website so folks can watch it. And it was, you know, it, it, we had a forum um, back in June that the two committee of the city council held that had a number of, of skeptical folks as part of the panel. And our goal with yesterday's webinar was really just to find out from other communities that have a plant like we do and are trying to use it in the way that we're proposing to use it, what their experience is. Um, I didn't know any of them before the webinar. We kind of you know, learned about them uh, through connecting with the International District Energy Association. And I hope that their experience was valuable to share with the community. If, it, if you didn't feel like it was, I apologize for that. But um, we were just trying to get information out. And certainly in the chat, there were a number of folks asking skeptical questions and the moderator brought those to the fore. Um, well, I think she tried to answer, you know, get as many answers as we could in our period. Now, in terms of McNeil, so in terms of air emissions, um, we've installed, as, as I think folks may know, uh, equipment so that the NOx emissions at McNeil are well below state and federal standards. The particulate emissions at McNeil, I think, are one-tenth of the state standard and one-one-hundredth of the federal standard. And in terms of carbon, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we have quantified those different emissions in terms of bringing wood to the plant. Seventy-five percent of our wood arrives by rail from the Swanton Wood Yard. Uh, only 25 percent comes by truck. That's part of our permit condition. Um, so most of the wood is coming in by rail. Uh, we have quantified all those emissions. They're on a, reports on our website. Um, I submit to you that based on the reviews that we've done, um, that using renewable local wood at McNeil has a far better carbon footprint for our community than using uh, imported natural gas or any other fossil fuel wood. Um, and we have data that, that shows that. Um, I understand not everyone looks at it that way, and that's, that's okay. Um, district energy isn't even really about that discussion per se. It, it's really about what you were getting at. We have a 40-year-old plant. There's nothing inherent about a 40-year-old plant that says you can't continue to operate. And I, in fact, think we're going to need it uh, for another 20 years because we have a reliability need. Uh, we need to be able to have a balance between solar, wind, hydro, and wood. Uh, McNeil runs when we need it. It's the only renewable plant we have that we can say, hey, we need power now. Prices are high. We don't want to be hit by those as a part of the New England system. We're going to run McNeil. I can't do that with solar. I can't do it with wind. And I can't do it with hydro. And until we have a grid that's far more renewable than we do today, I believe having McNeil has a lot of benefits for us. So the question we have is, is it worth uh, making an investment? And to be clear, it's not an investment by Burlington taxpayers. It's an investment that would be made by a nonprofit issuing bonds that would be paid back through the sale of the thermal energy to the customers. So this is not a taxpayer finance project. Um, very, very different uh, setup. So hopefully that's helpful in, in some context, but I appreciate, I hear your concern, I appreciate it. Thanks, I think that's a good segue into my question, which is actually a different kind of thing, but it's related. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that long-term vision of the Burlington Electric Department um, and the conversations I imagine the Electric Light Commission has been having. Um, I was just at a meeting about the frame and I had to leave a few minutes early to come here um, and they were talking about master planning like for the northern waterfront and 
I'm glad you're here because I didn't have the opportunity there to ask. The 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 two gas fired um, turbines down there yep. that you know we run for an hour every year just to test them. Right. That's like the one piece of the the waterfront that's like not you know enjoyable by the community. Do you are the, what's what's the conversations that's happening around that? Um, and then actually before you answer that, I'm just gonna say to the room like we have very skilled agroforestry scientists at UVM. Um, it might be a good idea to invite some of those folks to come and participate in this conversation. Give us an unbiased scientific opinion. So are you looking for an answer now or are you saying yeah, we I'm should have another conversation? I'm saying this conversation that we've been having, yeah, let's have another conversation and bring in some people with some good knowledge that can educate us. But right now I'm curious uh, to ask while I have the opportunity, is there any plan for the gas-powered turbines down at the waterfront by the frame to so, remove them somewhere so that we can have that waterfront? So I'm not aware of any plan or how costly it would be to move the gas turbines off the waterfront. We are actively exploring whether we can convert them uh, to run on something like biodiesel from restaurant oil. So that's part of what we're planning uh, relative to kind of their footprint. Um, but no, I don't know that there'd be anywhere we could move them very easily. Uh, they run, as you mentioned, almost never, but they provide a really important reliability <coughs> revenue stream uh, for our customers. So uh, yeah, I appreciate the dialogue there, but uh, no, no immediate plan to move that. I, I would like to thank you for um, offering up an example of inviting <laughs> people who are running these plants elsewhere in the country and elsewhere in the world mm -hmm. so that we can learn from them because there's a lot to learn sure. that we can't know. So I, for one, just want to thank you for the foresight and in gathering information from others. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. I just want to, um, my concern is, is the digging up what's going to happen in the streets. And I happen to live in an area that I know it's going to go through. I was already told it's going to go right in front of my house. Okay. But I live in an area where there is a lot of construction because the sewer system and everything else, a ton of construction. Right. I mean, um, you know, North Prospect was a mess for so long. And I, what's going to happen with, I mean, <laughs> Would you like, I mean, if you'd like, I'd love to take your contact information and I can connect you with the engineering team that's working on it and we can you know, get you more detail ahead of a future meeting or I'd be happy to have, you know, folks provide more information in that meeting. I'm not, I just want to be clear, I'm not the engineer who designed the project, so I don't want to speak to it in greater detail than I should. Uh, I very much understand the concern. I live in Burlington. Um, you know, I see the construction, obviously, in various parts of the city. I know in, in some cases it can be slower or more frustrating and uh, create impact. So I, I don't want to diminish that in any way. I totally appreciate what you're saying. I'd be happy to follow up if you'd like to share contact info. Sure. We got, we're going to shift to people online. Can, can I be heard online? Sharon or Carter, can you hear us? Sharon? Sharon, you have something you want to say? There's captions. Yes. We can't hear. But there's captions. We cannot hear you. But we can read it. We're reading. Yeah, Sharon, speak, and I'll read out your captions. Sharon, we can't hear you, but if you speak, there's uh, captions that are coming up on the screen. So I'll just read those aloud. I don't think 
that's going to work. I think you have to change the subject. All right. I think, um, you know, I apologize to the people online. Um, we're having some technical difficulties, and we'll have them resolved by the next meeting. But uh, I think uh, you're sort of SOL for today. So are, are we done with this conversation for today? We are. Is it possible to not be done with speak out? Because we've had two, you know, one issue and one comment on another issue. Could we have some speak out? Yes. That's all. Yes. One question for Derek. You mentioned that you're in the No, no, no. We, get, we got them. We, we have to move on. It's just a quick question. Okay. It's a yes or no answer. Okay. okay. You're looking at the economic viability of the project. What's the probability that it's going to pass? You asked for a yes or no answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we've designed a really economically uh, feasible version of this project. Um, I don't want to, you know, I wouldn't put a probability on it, um, but you, we're all going to know very soon. And our hope is, is if we do bring it to the council on the 10th, it's because we have a version of this that's penciling for the folks, uh, for, for the folks in the city, for the medical center, and for everybody else involved. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll, we'll be there hopefully in the near future. Okay. And just you thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we have other issues. Who has a different issue? Actually, it's not an issue. It's a celebration that um, a bunch of uh, NPA folk got together when in June uh, and planted. There's a kind of barren area at the, at the intersection of uh, Colchester Avenue and East Avenue. So we were coming. We were talking about doable projects we could do to improve the the livability of uh, Ward One. And a bunch of us got together. We got mostly donated plants. Uh, Carol bought a bunch of stuff. Uh, mulch and not not mulch, but fertilizer and other stuff. And Joel and and um, Sam helped out. Emily helped out. Uh, a bunch of folks. Uh, somebody donated some stone to make the pathway. And if you haven't checked it out yet, look at the, underneath the flagpole at the corner of East Avenue and Colchester Avenue. It's it's really transformed that area. We're hoping to get UVM to let us paint the flagpole. That seems unlikely, but but uh, that would be a nice touch for the winter. We think it's just some color there. Uh, but but a shout out to everybody who helped. And there'll be another uh, project on Triangle Park. And help me with a date, somebody. Um, October, so, yeah. early October, right? And Triangle Park is at the intersection of uh, Chase and Barrett. Yeah. So um, everybody's welcome to, to come on out, uh, contact. Um, who should they contact? Can they contact you, Sam, or Joel? Or? Um, they can contact me. Yeah. OK, Carol. OK, great. And well, we're just really happy, and we're hoping that we can come up with other projects like that around the ward, because uh, it only really took a, it took a bunch of organizing, but then just a, a morning of real hard work to get it in. So. It was fun. It was fun, yeah. Other, other issues for speak out? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I, I, Sam, I want to just, I just want to mention a, uh, uh, another incident that happened, which was kind of, it, it had a different outcome. Okay. And, and I think we got to consider this all in whole. I really appreciate what you said because it's really important. Yep. Um, my, my daughter and son-in-law were visiting over Labor Day weekend and with their two-year-old child and my son-in-law and little Elliot went down to the Pomeroy Park playground and they were playing. And these are two of the quietest people I know. <laughs> and they were, playing on, they were playing on the slide or something and um, somebody, somebody got up, they were outside the playground part, but they got up and started yelling at my son-in-law and my two-year-old child telling them that they should die for having woken him up. Um, and that's the unfortunate side of this. I don't think the, par the park ranger would have said all those things about this person. I think this person was really troubled. Yes. But I, don't, I also don't think that my two-year-old needs to hear that he should die from somebody when he's playing in a playground. So it's a, pro it's a problem, and we have to work the whole thing out. Yeah. Uh, three days later, somebody did see Click Fix Pomeroy Park, so I assume yeah. somebody else was, uh, was a, was, had, a, had a problem, yeah. and they did that.
Yeah, um, it's it's an unfortunate situation, and um, Joel and I have talked about it. It's just this um, always questioning morals of our comfortability versus people not being pr- privileged enough even to have a warm shower and warm food, and um, to be going through the things that they're going through. Um, it's it is very difficult and uh, troubling. Um, I think it's always. I think always the first step, in my opinion, is to always kind of show grace and love first. Um, I, it's very difficult when people are telling you that you should die for for <laughs> uh, waking them up. Um, but um, one uh, kind of second to that, sort of, one other thing that the ranger said was one way that he finds safety in going and interacting with any of these people is with food. And that sparks a very positive string in my heart. Um, And it's just food always, food is a really great icebreaker. It's something to keep people warm and full and feel safe. And um, it's uh, not gonna say that it's gonna solve the world's problems, but, it's yeah it's a very unfortunate situation um i know that there's other people who have said that they've found needles near their yards and that's a very frightening thing to experience um i think no matter what reach out to the rangers and see click fix anything that you see and um just show grace even though it's really difficult sometimes they, they just ran away. <laughs> that's, that's what they. I mean, there's a two-year-old kid. Yeah. You know, it's, it's difficult. No, no yeah. confrontation, no food. Yeah, I just want to continue with that. I also have met Neil and had just a wonderful conversation with him. And de-escalation is part of the training that they have. And so I'm just trying to imem- imagine if there was a person who was trained in de-escalation in that particular situation how they might have responded or how they might have you know brought those three people to be able to look each other in the eye Um, and I'm actually wondering if just in this moment if it makes sense for us even as an NPA to have some something happen in terms of de-escalation training Um, and I think the more people that have that as part of their toolkit um, you know, we'd know how to respond in those situations a little more carefully. And I think part of what Neil's doing, I mean, I know if he had been there, there would have been a conversation and those three people would have looked each other in the eye by the end of it. So maybe we need beat park rangers. <laughs> Honestly. We need know, what? Park rangers on the beat rather than on call. Maybe they should be, they should be strolling the city and going into parks. Yeah. Rather than having to see Cliff fix something, which is a five or six day. Can I make a comment? Um, We can move on. No, I I have just a comment relevant to this, and that's, you know, it sounds like waking up is a big issue, all right? I was on Church Street um, while it was almost dark this morning, and people who don't have housing are waking up. All right, the trucks are in to uh, service the restaurants and stuff. They're, they're on Church Street pretty early. And um, so people are active right then. And so maybe getting rangers to be in parks, maybe a good time to have them there is when people wake up. Yeah. That's all. I, I like the point of it, maybe not everybody in the MPA ward has to get training, but I think it relieves a lot of pressure off of the city who is already having difficulty finding people to fill jobs for all different departments. I think it's a good tool for everybody to have and um, whether or not you'll use it or you'll feel comfortable using it is one thing, but I think it's um, instead of relying on a specific department and waiting and calling them, even having just like the first steps I think could be a positive thing for more people in the community to have. And Chocolate Thunder Security, who we see, Mikey Van Goulden and his team, 
feel like we're seeing them everywhere. Um, you know, that's another example of just excellent, excellent de-escalation. I mean, I consider Mikey to be one of the most valuable players in the city, period. Yeah, and look at it, how many of us know him. Yeah. Do we have other uh, contributors to this? Right there. I got preoccupied with C Click Fix. Um, I really love that idea of us having some, what did you call it? Inter De-escalation. De mm -hmm. training. Just as, I mean, I just think, yeah, I love that idea. All right, and, um, any other speak out issues? Seeing none, we're gonna move forward to the next item, which is city council updates. And are Gary and Akira's here? N no, okay. Gary's not here, right? No. So we have bought a little bit of time. Okay. Would you like me to come up or would yeah, you, like do you to want hang up here? To replace by Tim? You're going to replace me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not, that works. Not kicking you out, but. <laughs> Usually you're on the other side of me. Oh. It's weird. You want to go first? Sure. Um, we haven't had a meeting in a while, but we also don't have that much time, so I won't try to do it. I do think we're kind of fusing the two items maybe. Is that right, Tom? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I'll start on some of the housing stuff just so that we can move to the public safety stuff. Um, and I started a presentation, but I didn't send it to anyone, so I will just link it in the front porch forum notes afterwards. Um, but I just want to do two things because a few things, a few people brought up before the meeting, the short-term rentals and the lawsuit. And so Tim and I didn't touch base, but we were on the same email chain um, in at least one instance. So um, I think we're both supportive of the current, current short-term rental ordinance. Um, I had a big part <laughs> in deciding what, what it was, so I'm definitely supportive of it. And what it is right now, just so people know, is you can basically rent in your rent as long as you live on the property is like the short form of like what we're allowed to do now um and there's a lawsuit out saying that the city can't regulate it this way i'm pretty i'm not a lawyer <laughs> tim can speak to it um i i'm pretty sure it's not i don't think that lawsuit's going to go very far just because the city was already regulating them as bed and breakfast before then and that had the same kind of standard of you needed to live in a whole bunch of other standards actually that airbnbs don't have so um I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I think our short-term rental compliance is going to stay um, as is. But that's just my quick thought on it because it was in the news. Anything to add? Um, I, I have not read the legal filing, so I don't have an opinion on the strength of the lawsuit. But Zarai is right. Um, I agree with the policy um, as it exists. Great. So I hope I hope it I hope we have a, a strong legal basis for it. And then um, some other things, just because we haven't met in a while, South End rezoning passed. That doesn't affect us quite as much um, here in the East End, but um, it passed. It does allow up to eight floors as recommended by the planning office. We did change it so that um, the view below Callahan Park can only be up to six feet as opposed to up to eight feet to try to preserve those views at the top of Callahan. Stories, yeah, did I say feet? <laughs> um, stories, not feet. Um, and then also, and I think that this just highlights the importance of public process and not, um, even though it can be frustrating pushing things too, through too quickly, I was talking to someone and we realized last minute that the South End allowed, that part of the South End allows offsite or payment in lose for affordable housing, which is kind of the last, um, like ways that we really have to still have affordable housing. I feel like a lot of folks who are living in Burlington um, who aren't well off are using our inclusionary zoning ordinance that was put in place back when Earhart was counselor maybe. Um, and so 
I was really grateful to Ben and Sarah from the South and North End, respectively, um, who got behind a last minute amendment of mine, which wasn't that elegant and the mayor didn't love, but um, decided not to oppose to not allow payment in lieu um, or offsite um, around it. And I do hope, I just uh, also a little bit of foresight, I think that was one of the, we weakened the inclusionary zoning a lot in 2019. That's actually one of the reasons I ran. And so I think that was the one that we really messed up on and that we shouldn't allow. That was one of the tenants. And so I'm hoping that Ben, Sarah and I and others, but we're on the ordinance committee can work together to change that at all. Cause the South end didn't qualify because it has low quality or like low income housing, but that's cause there's no housing there right now. Um, cause it's not zoned for that. Um, so it would have been a real travesty to have this new kind of high income neighborhood bubble up and not have um, any inclusionary zoning housing in it, especially because the in lieu payments are thirty five to seventy thousand dollars per unit, which doesn't buy you anything anywhere in Vermont, much less Burlington. Um, and then the next thing that's coming up is full city rezoning, which is feels like every year we've gotten even bigger. Like first we had short term rentals, then we had south end rezoning. Now we're going to have full city rezoning, which we're calling middle housing rezoning. So that's going to be a big thing that they're trying to push pretty quickly to get it on the ballot in March, I believe. Wait, are we doing ballot? I don't know. Ignore what I just said. I think I just misspoke. But we're trying to push it through pretty quickly. But again, I think it's worth taking the time, making sure we're not making mistakes just because of how big of a deal this will be and how much it will affect every single part of Burlington. But I am excited to see this pass. It's gonna be a lot of infill. Some of it is state mandated. So the state now says you cannot have single family ordinance housing. You have to allow things like duplexes everywhere in your city. So I think those changes are excited and hopefully helping us welcome more neighbors into Burlington. Yeah, and in terms of public engagement, um, Monday, uh, we had Megan Tuttle um, from the Office of City Planning and her uh, staff put on a, what I thought was a really good presentation that sort of laid the roadmap forward in terms of the meetings that we're going to have. Um, so to the extent that you are interested in, in this issue, um, I definitely recommend that and I recommend people being really, really engaged as this process goes forward. Um, and I think it might be worth to have one of those. I know that we've got the NPA meetings, but I think there are always so so many topics to cover. So having either one off topic, like to just focus on rezoning, because I think it's complicated enough and a big enough deal to spend a whole hour and a half on. So Sarah Morgan is scheduled to come in October, because um, she's the one who's sort of leading out on the rezoning. Um, so she's she's setting aside. I think we're setting aside 30 minutes on our October meeting. So. Make it an hour and a half. <laughs> you compromise that you just forego right your <laughs> report it's also just really interesting from us and I was completely ignorant of all this from just from a historical perspective how we ended up with what they call the sort of this missing this missing middle and how from a policy perspective we ended up where we are um, so yeah and we're not that's not unique to Burlington. That's a problem all across America. So we've got lots of lesson learn lessons learned from places all over the US on fixing our problematic zoning. Any other updates that you want to give, Tim? So you touched on the SEID, which I wanted to talk about. We've already discussed the McNeil plant, and there's more to come on that. Um, you know, the neighborhood code issue. Curiosity, where are you on the McNeil plan? Undecided. I'm also undecided. <laughs> Gen genuinely undecided. So uh, there are obviously people on the city council and otherwise that are firmly in favor of this, I think, fair to say. I don't know. That's why I asked. I actually seems don't know like, where people are seems at. Seems like there are people. Um, and then there are obviously folks who are clearly opposed, including folks in this room. Um, I am undecided. Carter wrote a very good thing in there for you to read later about the emissions from the McNeil plant, I think. But and children and their health. So I have a question. Of, I have written you both about short-term rental, and I'm glad to hear you support. You know that these people with the lawsuit are pretty out of line, it seems. But my concern, because I've lived here so long, and I know that we've had ordinances um, zoning about 
lot coverage that should be a parking lot and should be a green permeable soil and we've also had laws about single family homes turned into qu uh, group quarters and since you know 1997 when I've been involved trying to get the city to do something I was pretty unsuccessful there's a lot of things that have never been enforced so many of our neighborhoods are they've been taken over totally I mean in some time you know there have been some times that places are called student ghettos which is really horrible but I feel like with short-term rentals we're going to run into the same thing people are going to be driven out of their neighborhoods like people were driven out of their neighborhoods uh, before because uh, investors are buying properties especially like on Lakeview Terrace and they're renting them for exorbitant and they're not living there at all they are taking whole houses and renting them out for large sums of money per mm -hmm. night. And the people that live there don't want that. Um, and now this lawsuit is happening, which one of the people that bought the houses, he's like a big driver on this lawsuit. So yeah. if we can, as a city, you know, it's just supporting our neighborhoods, just like we did not support Lori Loomis or Union or any of those places that I know families that were driven out because of the student population just taking over. Um, I hate to, excuse me, I hate to see that happen in more of our neighborhoods and driving out our families that come to the meetings and, you know, people that are guests should be in our hotels, not taken over our houses. So, I mean, anyway, it will all be about enforcement. I mean, th this is one of the impetuses behind the the short-term rental ordinance. I mean, this is what I think Zoraida exactly, was but, aiming to protect against. But Bill against. Ward announced they've never given a fine. And we know there are people, it was supposed to start in May that it was going to be enforced. This is the end of September, or begin, middle of September, and no one has been fined. They are still renting out their whole houses. I, I do have to get an update on that. I do think, and I understand why you're so frustrated with enforcement i hope my hope is that because this is like large part like online and paper enforcement right it's like a website is telling us what places are out of compliance we can just send a notice of like being out of compliance it's not as much of the although i understand that that's you've done a lot of the documentation that's like <laughs> um that would otherwise be like difficult or like more work to do um, but I also, I haven't gotten an update, I have to admit, from on like what enforcement we have started doing, but I assume the lawsuit is coming because we started doing that enforcement, I, is, my, is my assumption of why it's waited this long um, until for them to do it. But I, I will find out and get okay. back to you on that. Great, thanks. Just quickly to follow up on that, I mean, I, um, I totally support what Karen's saying. What I read was Bill said that he wasn't enforcing because of the lawsuit. Uh, I may be misremembering that, but it just struck me as, you know, it was quoted in the paper, so maybe, you know, the reporting is not always 100%, but um, it just struck me as really weird, too, um, because I was under the impression that he had said he's not enforcing because of the suit, which makes no sense to me. I will check on that as well. I have Thanks. read it to assume that he wasn't enforcing on those people because of, once they've been issued whatever, but I will find out. And I think one other thing that, you know, obviously the city's going to have to defend the suit as vigorously as, as possible. But, you know, one of the things to look at is it does look like the fine is not very substantial given um, the amount of income that people are making off of Airbnbs. I mean, people could just take the fine, pay it, and they'll still make a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, I, I might have to check. I think because it's an ongoing fine, you can get fined for every day that there's a violation. So it's not a one-time $200, whatever it was, but um, yeah. But other cities triple what they collect. Say you're charging $600, your fine then is $1,800 and in places that have you know tried to crack down. Right, because to some extent, if you do have one of the really big lake houses, you can make significantly more than $200 a night, yeah. Okay, I'll look into that. Um, do we want to shift gears and talk about... Public safety? Public safety. Right, that's not you, that's me. Um, which well, is, I, I care about it too. <laughs> right, but you weren't asked to prepare something to because we thought you weren't going to be here. Um, which you can add all of your thoughts. I'm just gonna go through some stats and I will say, 
Um, there's, I didn't get, to, I didn't get to all the topics. So there's three topics we can start on. So there's nothing on graffiti, which I know we've talked about in the past. I didn't get an update on that. Um, Is there a Yes. Could you sort of describe how you're going to frame this or, you know, how we start thinking about it before you go into the details? Yeah. So I, I am <laughs> going to just give updates on what has happened on four topics, which is houselessness. <clears throat> nope. Three topics, houselessness, opioids, and police response. And then folks can ask some questions if they have them or discuss. And then I know that you all have a plan for working groups or something like that. I don't know if that's Carter or somebody in the room. Well, we were hoping to hear, I mean, you're sort of introducing oh, Mike. the background information for us. And then from there, we would figure out panels to, to try to put to those in more depth. In depth, great. Um, so I think we could talk about what some of the other things are, but for me, the biggest one, as you all probably know, is houselessness, which I'll, is that okay, Tom, to do it in that way? Um, so as of May 2023, and I apologize that I don't have this up on screen, but I will share it on Front Porch Forum. You could share it if you want. Okay, it's not pretty, but I can share it. Oh, I have a... I, you should just proceed and talk. Okay. About that. okay. Sorry, I will follow up with notes on Front Porch Forum. Um, as of May 2023, there were 633 households experiencing homelessness in Chittenden County. We haven't really done updates since then because most of the people who work on this have just been scrambling to help people who were, ev who were exited out of the motel program. Um, we know that there's over 200 people who are unsheltered in Burlington right now. There's a waiting list of over 150 people for the is it Elmwood housing? Starts with an E housing. The pods, Elmwood, Elmwood pods, um, and the shelters are full. And even just the usual baseline leads, so not like housing, but things like supplies to people is much more stretched now than it was pre-pandemic, just given some of the volume. Um, I do want to say, just because I think there's some rumors flying around, the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness in Vermont and in Chittenden County and in Burlington are Vermonters. They are not from out of state. There's not people moving here to be homeless here. Um, the um, Burlington requested to convert the state office buildings into 50 to 75 bed homeless shelter. That was not approved by the state, so that's not coming. Um, and then sh the Champlain Inn, um, a new place shut down, or didn't shut down, but was sh in the process of shutting down, and CVOEO has taken over management um, so that that can continue to be a facility for our neighborhoods. So I have nothing but bad news on that. I'm sorry, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of bad news. Um, there's not a lot of plans in the works. Um, honestly, there's both a lack of funding, which is what, happened with the Champlain Inn, and there's also a lack of, um, which is partially related to the lack of funding, but there's an also just a lack of staffing, um, especially as folks become more and more chronically homeless, the needs get more and more acute, as we were having in our conversation earlier, and so the way that we think about sheltering, which before a lot, there used to be a lot of like volunteerism around that, and right, and things like that, and more and more it's becoming professionalized just as people need training to deal with more acute needs, which is related to but not um, totally overlapping with the opioid crisis. Um, I just feel like I need to pause there because that was hard. <laughs> um, any questions on that? Can you repeat that again? <laughs> with the whole thing? The <laughs> oh, that I feel like I need to take a pause because that was hard. <laughs> the part just before that. About the opioid crisis. Yeah. Oh, I said which is related. I just, I, there's like, there's a mental health problem that's been going on since the pandemic, which is one thing and that's affecting a lot of us. There's a homelessness crisis that's happening and that has been made worse in Vermont. Um, for a variety of reasons. And then there's also the opioid crisis. And those three, there's a thread that runs through them, but I also don't want people to think that if you are one, you're necessarily all two of the other ones. And so I feel like there's been some conflating going on, but they're also not unrelated, so. 
I don't necessarily. Oh, uh, I don't necessarily have a question, but I. It's more not directly for you, but to everybody in the room. And um, would people be interested in if we were able to compile a list of things that people would need if people in the room and other people online or in the ward would be willing to donate some things so that we can help with this uh, decrease in volunteerism? Like if we can be as a ward help with resources for some of these unhoused people and show some, some sympathy and grace towards them, is that something that people would be interested, whether it's food or like I was even thinking like women like could use uh, feminine products and toothbrushes and wet wipes or toilet paper or anything like I, I just feel like it's there's a lot of um, opportunity in this room to help and so I was reaching out to the room to see if people would be interested in that Oh, I was just going to say, and like, this is how the old East End mutual aid is born. So, uh, you know, I'm part of the People's Kitchen. And I'm wearing my People's Farm Stand shirt. So let's talk. Yeah. To, to that point, I mean, there are, you know, the kinds of um, kits that you're talking about, uh, Committee on Temporary Shelter collects those um, and hands them out to the folks that they serve. CVOEO does. Uh, I'm not sure we need to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah. There, you know, there are existing um, mechanisms like the one um, that Jake just mentioned, and then the nonprofits that are, are providing uh, services. That said, those folks are understaffed, and they can all use volunteers. Um, so, if folks do find themselves with free time. Um, that is, you know, I think they'd all all be welcome. Um, you know, the CVOEO runs the resource center at the. Um, at the uh, at the food shelf, um, they can use help. And just one more comment: I, I just want to make sure that people aren't left with the impression that everyone who is experiencing homelessness is either uh, suffering from substance use disorder or mental illness. It is absolutely not the case. Homelessness is um, it, it has many factors, but one of the main factors is people don't have housing, and our market economy does not uh, work for low-income people, uh, people with disabilities, and people um, who simply don't have the money to afford the outrageous rents that are being charged these days. Um, there are structural issues with the economy um, that do not work for low-income uh, and, and low-resource people and folks from marginalized communities. So it's not just that everybody's got mental illness and everybody's got substance use disorder. It's just some of these folks are just poor uh, and they cannot afford housing and there is no housing for them to rent because we have one of the lowest vacancy rates for rental housing in the country um, and we also as uh, as a result have the second highest rate of homelessness uh, in this country and again a lot of these folks are folks that are living in their cars or they're living in tents and they're actually going to work every day um, and that is really really hard I mean just think about going to work uh, when you got no place to brush your teeth you got no place to freshen your face and get the sleepy sand out of your eyes and you're expected to you know to to put in eight hours so that's the situation for a lot of a lot of folks who are experiencing homelessness and I, I just hope folks remember that it, it's not like there's a deserving uh, group of folks who are homeless and uh, and an undeserving group of folks who are homeless um, they all have one thing in common they don't have housing and I just want to I, that's what I was trying to say, and I'm glad that you um, redoubled down on, on, on it, because I do think it's in a really important point. Um, and I mean, I think I'm one of the hardest working people that I know, and I was homeless for a while because between college and before, like, and I had a college degree. I had a college degree, and I couldn't afford my security deposit, and until, I, and I was going to work every day at a law firm, but until I got my first couple of paychecks, I didn't have a security deposit, so I just didn't get housing and that was in Oklahoma which has a low vacancy rate and very low cost of housing and so in Burlington and I think that's the other thing is that as we're getting into more and more of a housing crunch anything right a divorce like a anything can mean that you suddenly no longer have housing and there's nothing that anyone can really do about it because there's no alternatives um, so thanks Earhart. Earhart I got a question is it better for people who want to volunteer to um, 
do so as individuals and can we provide a list of agencies that they could talk to or would it be better to get someone from those agencies to our next meeting or have a separate meeting so that we can um, understand what their needs are and and approach it from that point of view i mean i you know i'm not on the steering committee you guys have a better view of the agenda and what's coming up no, no, but no, i'm not talking about agenda i'm talking about the these organizations like yeah i mean CBOEO. if you wanted to have paul dragon from cvoeo come talk or jonathan farrell from cots you know uh, is and it, is it better to bring them here to an, an, an i'm sure they'd be willing to come to help um you know provide their perspective to the npa okay Jake and I can also yeah. help with getting some collective things out. I was really just asking, yeah. bring them here or individuals go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. So that was number one. Um, opioids. Um, I don't want to read this. Um, so we all, I think we've all read the things um, that we've already had more overdose responses, overdose deaths, all of the statistics that we've had by this time that we've already had this year outweigh what we had last year, which outweighs anything that we had the year before. Um, that's really all I have on that. Um, the, I'm not actually 100% sure where we are, and I didn't apparently pull it on where we are on the over, sorry, the safe injection sites, um, which I think might be at the, with the state right now. Do you know if that's true, Tim? I think it's with the state. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we've gotten any update on that, um, but that's happening. And I, I don't think it's often, I don't think the view is optimistic, is my sense. I, is there a, it seems like if you went back a couple of years ago, people would, uh, uh, in the press, a lot of drug addiction, addictions were attributed to oxycodone. And I don't hear that so much. Um, what I'm hearing is uh, that there's overdoses because of fentanyl. But I'm not sure how people get started. I mean, has, has the way people get started, has it really changed or is it unchanged in your opinion over the, say the last three or four years? I don't know. Well, I, I'm not an expert, but I, I, I was a federal prosecutor when the situation evolved. And, you know, my first two or three years as a federal prosecutor, we didn't have any heroin, really, to speak of cases. It was all oxycodone cases. And then at some point, and I'm forgetting the exact year, 2010, we could look it up, 2010, 2011, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies changed um, the makeup of oxycodone to make it more difficult to divert, um, to make it more difficult to crush and snort. And naively, those of us who were, were in the field were, thought that was great news. Um, and very soon thereafter, um, we started to see heroin in Vermont um, at, at a level that we hadn't seen since the late 90s. There was a heroin boom in Vermont in the late 90s, nothing like we have now. So. You know, you had opioid addicted folks who were no longer accessing, no, no longer having diverted Percocets and oxycodones available to them. And of course, without readily available treatment, um, they turned to heroin, um, which has since become adulterated with fentanyl and carfentanyl um, by the dealers who come up here and profit um, from the trade. In terms of how any individual person becomes addicted to opioids, it's obviously there's as many ways as there are that you can possibly imagine. Um, but certainly there was a time in which the medical community was systemically over prescribing opioids. So there was a big shift in the way the medical community viewed and treated pain management. Um, and there's, there's lots of stuff to read about that. Um, but, but many people in Vermont, again, when I was deeply involved in this would tell you a story about a back injury, um, a sports injury, 
um, a work-related injury, being prescribed opioids, which I think now the medical community recognizes over-prescription or inappropriate prescription, becoming addicted um, that way. Um, but that's certainly not the only way people come, become addicted to opioids. If that's helpful. Yeah, okay. But, you know, even in my short, you know, my sh relatively short time in the field, <coughs> the change in the drug trade in Vermont was absolutely draconian and um, just an ex it was an extraordinary sea change to watch it happen over a very short period of time. Okay, thanks. So, as a steering committee person who's asked Soraya to do this, um, I, I would be really interested in hearing resources that you all think would be important to have come here to fill us in on what what this crisis means. Because I know from going to the memorial um, two weeks ago that was in City Park, I mean, there was so much that I learned just listening to people's stories um, and listening to Tanya and listening to Moreau and listening to Sarah George. I mean, there are, there are leaders who, who seem like they, they get it. Um, so what is, what's the load and is it us? Are we the ones that need to get more um, riveted and more um, educated and more on board um, and not so punitive? Um, and I think we could really use information that can help us better understand. So if you all could help us figure that out, I think, I think at least, at least one, one meeting talking about opioids and talking about how, this, how we've come to this place and what we can do. Because you're hearing from this group that we want to do something, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think there is. I think we're that quiet, middle class, white majority that are misunderstanding what the, st what the story is and we need to use our voices, I think, in a louder way to move the issue. So I think, so I, I don't feel as educated on like why people um, take um, opioids in the first place or why, um, but what I do, so I think that the response to like, thank goodness, like the response to this like drug crisis has been more sympathetic than any that we've had ever before. Um, and so I do think that to some extent we're not prosecuting in the same ways we're not doing some of those things. So I don't think that there's as much advocacy to be done around that. Um, however, I think there's still a lot of um, like people, I do think that there's a lot to be learned about. And I think that this actually goes with what we were talking about earlier around like just understanding, like people don't understand the difference between someone who is, um, overdosing, someone who's just in a mental health crisis, someone who's just like homeless and has absolutely no issues, I think they really get lumped. And so I'm not the right person to give that training, but I think that getting some valuable training on when you encounter someone, um, what they're maybe going through um, and what you should do based on that, I think would be really helpful as a community. And then of course, things like um, knowing how to um, administer Narcan and things like that is helpful if you're going to be doing that as well. Um, I think some of the other things, um, and then this is because again, I know more about like the housing side of things. Like I do think like the, there's, and I think that this is like, this is a thing that takes time, right? So I think that some of the folks who do mutual aid, like those communities are aware of like, these are the folks who are just really struggling and having a hard time. Like these are the folks who, if you catch them on a bad day, they're gonna be having a bad day. And these are the folks who are just always just trying to make it. And so I think the more people that we have who are like, because ultimately like we just as a city and even as like nonprofits, like the need has become so acute, but also so broad. Like there's so many more people than there were who are um, experiencing some of these issues. Um, but I do think that having more people who are looking out for more people would be a good thing so that it becomes an individualized response as opposed to a, because on a like broad scale, it's like, how do we suddenly house 700 more people in our county? That's a really difficult problem. But it's like, oh, how do we like get 10 more people who we know that they have what they need if they need it and that we're having conversations with them and keeping them accountable? That's a little bit easier. So that would be my recommendation around what we can do. And then also, I just think it's, 
and this is, I say this to it, but I think, I think it's a little bit of a moral failing on our city that we are choosing to spend our budget in the exact same way as though these crises aren't happening. And we're saying we need state and federal resources. I agree with that. We can't solve this on the city budget alone, but it honestly is a little bit hard for me to care about some of the other stuff when this is happening um, in our city. And so I do think that there's some advocacy to be said around like, no, we actually do want to spend our money a little bit differently. Like, I actually think that, you know, maybe some of these things can go for like a little bit until we, and so even I was thinking about for the housing, just because I'm on the seating art chair and I am part of the housing trust fund, it's like, I care about affordable housing as much as anybody on the city council. And I'm like, maybe this is the year where none of it goes to all of the other initiatives and we just, <laughs> air hearts frowning at me. And like, we just spend all of it on being like, if we put the entirety of the housing trust fund to one organization to try to do something around homelessness, will that put a dent into it? Not a small dent, but still like a dent. So. I think there's some advocacy to be done around how we spend our money as a city. Because I think we're doing what we can to get the state and federal funds. And then even around like Sarah Russell, like I don't know when her position's gonna end. Like I don't even, and we need more coordination, not less coordination around this stuff. Go ahead. I, I, would, I would also say, Carol, too, one, I mean, you know, one thing maybe to think about is to try and, you know, because these problems are so big and overlapping, right? So we've, we've pointed out, right? Not everyone who's experiencing homelessness as a mental health, is experiencing a mental health problem. Not everyone who's experiencing a mental health problem is addicted to opioids. Not everyone who's addicted to opioids is experiencing houselessness, right? Like, so it, it is, we can't lump this all together because that's, that's no path for any solutions. Um, and it is, a, it is a significant series of structural issues going on you know, from an NPA's perspective, I don't want to tell the NPA steering committee how to do it, but, you know, you might want to think about narrowing your focus, right? And I don't know what that focus should be, but, you know, you might want to choose one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you might, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, Lee Morgan was talking about her initiative in, uh, in, in working in the parks to clean up needles. That's not a solution to anything, except needles in our parks, right? But it's not that, and so nobody's pretending like that's going to solve any of these problems, but it doesn't make it a worth, it, it doesn't make it a, a, a task that's not worth doing. Um, so just a thought, not a particular articulate thought. So if, if we chose one thing, one of the things I'd like us to consider is what do we do when we encounter somebody who's in real need and um, how do we and get educated on what kind of resources there are, how to use Narcan, um, make that available, those kinds of things. So that, um, you know, there were some people um, hiding in the bushes between my house and Chris and Sherry's house, I, uh, Peter and Cheryl know. And they, I went, went over to talk with them and they said, we just need a place that's safe. And they were clearly wanting to, they said we're just sitting down to talk, but they clearly needed a place to stay for the night. And not knowing anything else, to, um, because I don't know much about this, I suggested they, because they didn't want to go far, I suggested they go into Centennial Woods. Uh, but they were worried about their safety, and they w wanted to get some rest, and they wanted to be away from, um, from drugs, although they probably had been using, uh, but it, they just needed to be safe. And I, I really didn't, I felt inadequate in how to, to get them safe. And I will say that's not, I'm sorry. And also I feel like the city staff feel the same way because they also don't have, literally they don't have anywhere to tell people to go to be safe, um, which is a hard place to be in for anyone. Well, maybe this is what we talk about at our next meeting. I mean, one of our agenda, agenda, <coughs> agenda items is to say, what are we going to talk about at our next meeting? And bring someone in to say, what can we do? Um, how can we get trained? And I mean, what can we do as a group and what can we do as individuals when we encounter uh, various people in various states? I think, you know, me and Lacey and Fareed could probably answer, like, I feel like I could answer in very, very strong detailed 
like uh best practice like because i'm also an emt like i i and farid is like mr mutual aid he started people's kitchen back in 2010 um and he cooks and he sent me here with a message for the steering committee that he would like to cook for ward one um and so we can bring the food element of the mutual aid and Lacey is uh the original csl and one of my good friends um so yeah I, i'll just offer that to you guys yeah and that's the last uh community Lace. support liaison but back you know she was doing it for like seven years before there were others right. and, and she's also the sorry predece predecessor of sarah russell and the last thing that I'll say around that is I do think that there's, like, that there's a, ver like, if, if you aren't comfortable, like, right, there's a level of, there's different levels of comfort, and I think there's tasks for everyone regardless of their level of comfort. I'll leave it there. You know, you know one, other, one other thing people can do is speak out in favor of more housing. Um, it's very simple. Um, you know, there's... Uh, Zariah was mentioning, um, you know, some of the rezoning that's going to be going on. Uh, don't oppose it. Um, you know, speak for it, um, because part of what kills housing is NIMBYism, and uh, you know, a lot of us, um, you know, kind of have the impulse of we don't like development, we don't want more housing. Um, don't be that way. Um, say yes to housing. Or I don't want this. I feel like when the new place came up or when Elmwood happened, people were like, I'm supportive of this. I just don't want it here. <laughs> so, and <laughs> another piece to the, to the housing issue is uh, keeping Vermont, uh, UVM's student population in control. Exactly. So UVM has got to take care of the people that they enroll. And uh, what they're doing is saying, well, we're gonna house them for two years. That means way more every, additional freshmen that they bring in is an additional junior and senior that's gonna be looking for housing off campus. And that's, that's killing our housing. Yep, yep. very good city. And despite saying for years that there's no additional students. Right. Yeah. Which there they are, <laughs> yeah. Which isn't to say we don't want the students, we just want them housed safely. There is good news on that. Yeah, are you gonna talk about what's going on in South Burlington? I, I think, you know, it's worth mentioning that. Mention it, please. Uh, there's the, the University of Vermont is building. The University of Vermont is building um, uh, hundreds of units. I can't remember the exact number. I think it's maybe 400. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, ultimately, in uh, in the new city center um, over in uh, in South Burlington, and it's you know it's going to be uh, designated for um, for. for for graduate students and uh, as well as um, upper upper class students, so uh, I think that it, it's it, it's a phase development. It's going to happen over several years, um, but it's uh, I think it's good news. The, the problem is that they may also increase, as I think we know, enrollment at the same time. Yes. Yeah, it seems like it seems like the question to ask is what does that do to our vacancy rates? You know, it's a, it's great, it's good news, but what does it do to the vacancy rates? And it may do, it may Every do nothing. Bit helps. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're running close to the end of our meeting, so, uh, Zoraya, Tim, is there something else you I want to bring I think Tim up? had one point around that, and then I'll close out. Well, I, I did want to mention, and, and I asked Zoraya, because I'm still new to these executive session rules, um, we did, Zoraya and I and Hannah King did meet with, and Karen Paul, met in August with UVM and got an update on the continuing negotiations with respect to new UVM housing and the zoning issue. Um, that is still part of this executive session, you know, bargaining, um, but, but you, you should know that there is continued discussion and, uh, and we're, we're a part of it. You're talking about the Trinity Campus discussion. Yes. Okay. And the MOU discussion, I guess. The MOU discussion. Okay. And, and I'm sorry we can't provide you details yet, but <coughs> Great. Ha stuff, stuff's happening. And then just my last final point is on police response, um, which isn't just, I guess not police response, additional responses, alternative responses. So or I guess police response up from the low of 62 officers to 67 officers. We have 
Um, in the police department, eight additional positions. So as Jake was mentioning, we have four additional community service liaisons and five community service officers. Um, and then on the park side, we have the urban park rangers, which Neil is the head of. Um, what's going on with it? Yeah. Is it what's going on with, is it Kutz or Kuntz or like Kutz? The, the response team that's supposed to be part of it. Oh, I'm not 100% sure what the... Cahoots. What, no, cahoots it's... Or, yeah. It was Cahoots and ours is CARES. Yes. Um, it started as Cahoots, though. Yes, it started as Cahoots um, in another city, and we're calling ours CARES. And it's moving forward. We had the RFP. I'm not 100% sure, actually. I need to get an update on that, where that's been last. So the last thing that we had was that we didn't fully have the funding for it. We had a $400,000 gap. Um that we were trying to get funding for, but we did move forward with hiring for the like monitor for that position, or at least with posting for that. I don't know what's happened since then, so I can get some short-term rentals and CARES updates. Is Ryan on that subject? Microphone. Sort of. Microphone. Oh, sort of. Um, <laughs> so, your piece was uh, public safety. So th the perception that I have, anyway, is that the police just don't care about um, uh, items of prob uh, public safety that don't have to do with the topics that you've mentioned or anything with guns. So would you... Like there's there's no traffic enforcement, for instance. Institutionally, there's no traffic enforcement. Um, we are told that if there's um, burglaries or um, property theft, that that's not important, probably because it wouldn't be prosecuted anyway. When are we going to get our arms around that and um, have a proper uh, police force again? Or is there going to be a time when the, the Ch uh, Chittenden County, for, for want of a better word, takes responsibility for some of the things that um, are happening in Burlington that are fostered in other parts of the county or other parts of the state? So why, why, when is... Burlington going to stop paying the bill effectively for uh, some of the things that you've talked about, which um, are, are all exceptionally important. Yeah, so the traffic decision was, of course, pre-anything, pre-COVID, so the reducing the enforcement of traffic was a decision that was made long before I was on the council. Um, and um, at the, so that was at the height of kind of the police force, so I think that's unrelated to, um, I think that was a policy decision. Um, yeah, was it the right one? Was it correct? I, would, would, we have what? three minutes left, so I won't go too deeply into that, and well, then... I addressed it last time, and I, I, I wrote to you and Tim with details of uh, a thread with various uh, police officers. Uh, and I didn't get a response, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, and yeah, so I don't, I don't think that, the, I, yeah, I think that that was a decision that was made. I don't think that this is probably when we're going to revisit that decision. Um, the burglary things, the official stance of the police department is still to report everything that happens. Um, In, By uh, email. Or to them. Yes. If we get burglared. Correct. Okay. By email, though. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. Well, I, I have just a general question, and I, I don't really expect an answer, but I want to ask it anyhow. And that's, in your opinion, are the police, uh, given their head count, are they uh, deployed effectively, and are they doing a good job? Given their head count. Um, so I, I think that this is a, like bigger. I, 
I'm trying not to get political. I think that the um, I think that there's been a lot of choices, not necessarily on the parts of individual officers that continue to make the job a little harder than it needs to be. And I don't know, and I, I think that is a lot around morale. Like I think the morale of the police department is still really low. I think we're still getting more officers. Um, but I also think it doesn't make it, I think it makes it harder than it's to be both on the officer side, but I also think it makes it less effective than you would hope it to be on the community side. That is as okay. non-answer of an answer as I can possibly give, but. <laughs> well, I do appreciate that. Um, we're at the end of our meeting, but we did have uh, one thing we wanted to, to sort of <laughs> Yeah, where's Tim's answer to these yeah, questions? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't asked. <laughs> did you want to Please say something? Answer. Collectively, no. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm way behind Soraya. <laughs> I think what I'm walking away with is that there's a couple things that we want to bring up for our next meeting. Um, more about uh, public safety and also the things that ails that causes um, homelessness and drug addiction and how we can help. So uh, I think as a steering committee, we're going to talk about that and how to um, bring our NPA in on further discussions. Well, and I'm hearing an interest in the neighborhood zoning and also about more about BED and the district heating. Yeah. Am I hearing that as well? Okay. All right. As long as the steering committee is talking. Yeah. And we would welcome anybody who wants to be on the steering committee to join us. It's a great place to strategize, make conversation, talk with people, have snacks. So, so there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of work to do and if there's anybody else who wants to participate, we'd welcome people to join the steering committee. I just also want to give a big thank you to the steering committee, to all the video support and also to Zariah and Tim. Um, you know, this is the conver kind of conversation that is rich and so important. And the assignment for the next? NPA is bring a friend who's never come to NPA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, we're going to, I can stand up. We're going to officially conclude our meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.